left you guys off. Where I left you guys off was a um, breakdown of the way we use taxonomy to um, describe living organisms and how they relate to one another, um, and basically where the life domains, the um, prokaryota and the eukaryota, um, are in relation to each other and how those get broken down. I'm going to do a continuation of that so we can eventually get to the Lepidoptera. So, the eukaryota, eukaryota has um, a wide array of well-known organisms, including plants, animals, and fungi, as well as several other groups that are vastly understudied, unfortunately, but are probably more um, numerous or abundant than we realize and maybe more so than the ones we study even better. Anyway, um, within the eukaryota, we have the metazoa, which are your animals. To be an animal, you have to be a heterotrophic eukaryote. You have to have an internal digestive column or a hollowing of your body to accommodate food and to assimilate nutrients. And while cell-type specialization is... Um, Required, there are some exceptions to this um, in some really primitive organisms that we don't know if they're colonial protists or um, animals. Um, and this is basically a phylo phylogenetic tree. You have a breakdown here, and basically the way this works is everybody here falls into here. But, not everybody here falls into here. Only all of these guys fall into here. Only all, only these guys fall into here. And everybody here belongs to every previous group. So, within the metazoa, you have eumetazoa, which are your true animals, so to speak, and your parazoa. Um, which is just the periphera or sponges, which don't really have specific tissues. They still have cell type specialization, which makes them animals. Um, but they don't really have um, tissues and organs in the sense that we think of them being membrane bound and organized like most animals we think of. And then we go to our eumetazoa, which include everything else. If we look at the eumetazoa, they break down into something called the radiata, which is a group of animals that are known for having radial symmetry, and this includes the jellyfish and comb jellies, and their relation to one another is still under some review. Some people think they're more basal, the comb jellies are more basal, and some people think that they have a very recent common ancestor, which is why we have this weird bracket here rather than a distinctive cutoff point. Um, if, um, you're not one of these groups, you're classified as a bilaterian. Because you are bilaterally symmetric, there is one axis of division where an animal is relatively identical. Um, basically the animal from this point is a mirror image of itself. And obviously, in the real world, animals are not exactly symmetrical. There might be some, you know... For example, in humans, you know, your um, fingernails in your left hand might grow quicker than the fingernails in your right hand, or maybe the um, skin is a little bit thicker, thinner, whatever. Um, then we go into acelomates and coelomates. If you're a coelomate, you have a body cavity. If you're an acelomate, you don't have a body cavity. This goes back to embryonic development, where um, if you have... Um, the embryo um, collapsing in on itself, you um, to kind of form a tube, you are a coelomate. Now, we want to quickly mention the distinctions protosomia and deuterostomia are distinctions that can only apply to a coelomate. Of course, um, because they refer to how the um, cavity forms. Um, when we get into the insects in a moment, or later, maybe in the next video, we will um, see how some distinctions are um, important to recognize. We have protostomes and deuterostomes. Um, I have made a um, nice little 
infographic here. If you are a protostorm stone, the um, blastopore, which is the hole that forms as the embryo that is developing, um, collapse, well, the embryo hollows out and then these cells kind of get swallowed by the hole. And if you are a protostorm stone, that hole becomes your mouth. If you're a deuterostome, that hole becomes your anus. Now, mammals and echinoderms are classified as deuterostomes. We're not worried about these groups. Chordata are all the organisms that have, at one point in their development, a um, spinal cord. Not necessarily vertebrae. There are some animals such as, um, what are they? Um, the, um, they're marine, the tunicates, that have a larva with the spinal cord, but the spinal cord degenerates as well as all of the muscles in the body when it becomes a sessile adult. Um, protostorm somes have far more organisms and far more phyla. Um, here, these are, this is all phyla level stuff. Um, these are just... <clears throat> greater distinctions here. Um, you know, we generally go from kingdom to phylum, but there are all these other breaks in between. Um, Ecdysozoa is a group of animals that have this outer skin that they must shed in order to grow. By the way, all of these are invertebrates, and all of these are invertebrates. Only the chordata possesses the vertebrates. Um, and as you can see on the far right, I have kind of clustered, this is ecdysozoa, all of this is protostomia, all of this is coelomata, all of this is eumetazoa, and then all of this is metazoa. Um, so within the ecdysozoa, we have our arthropods and we have our nematodes. Um, nematomorpha technically... Um, also falls in this group. Um, this is just an image I pulled off of Google, so it's a little outdated, but this is the gist of what's going on. So if we zoom in on the kingdom, or the phylum Arthropoda, um, which is a group of animals known for um, an external um, skeleton, called an exoskeleton, obviously, and um, legs that are made up of joints, which the joints allow for the leg to pivot and move to move the animal. Um, within the arthropoda, we are broken down into the mandibulata and the chelicerata. These classifications are based upon the, um, I don't know why I didn't, oh well, oh, so, what I'm doing here is everybody in green is our path to our lepidopterans, and so I am not going to even bother breaking down the chelicerata. The chelicerata is basically the, um, horseshoe crabs, and the um, um, arachnids, and a few other things. Um, they have these chelicerate mouth parts, which are different than the mandibles of the mandibulata. Those are the distinctions. Within the mandibulata, we are broken down into myriapoda and pancrustacea. Pancrustacea contains the crustaceans and the hexapods. Um, hexapods are not the same thing as insects. Hexapods are a group that also contain our endognata, which and dognatha, which are the springtails, fire brats. No, not the fire brats, sorry. Springtails and um, a few other related groups of animals that have six legs, but they're called endognatha because their mouth parts are inside of the head. They don't have external mouth parts, which distinguishes them from the insecta. Within the insecta, insects are classified as either <coughs> aterogous or pterygus. If you are pterygus, you are winged. Aterogota are your very primitive insects, your silverfish, your fire brats, and a few other guys. Your pterygota are everything else, which includes your lepidoptera. Now, keep in mind, neoptera and paleoptera refer to wingedness, so they only make sense in the context of pterygota. If you have neopterans, these are the most recent evolutionary group of insects um, that have the ability to fold their wings somehow. The um, 
joints connecting the wing to the thorax is movable enough so that it can fold. Paleoptera are things like the ephemeroptera, which are your mayflies, and your um, odonata, which are your dragonflies. <clears throat> Those are very primitive insects. Within the Neoptera, we have Exoterragota and Endoterragota. Here is where things get a little bit confusing. The Exoterragotes are animals that have incomplete metamorphosis. I know what you're thinking. The Paleopteran insects undergo incomplete metamorphosis. Wouldn't that make them Exoterragotes? Well, Exoterragota is a classification within the Neoptera, so it makes sense within the context of the Neoptera. Yes the Paleopteran insects undergo incomplete metamorphosis, but you're not automatically an exoterago just because you undergo incomplete metamorphosis. In that respect, um, this is a more um, precise term than the term holo and hemometabolus will ever be. Um, hemometabolus are your um, incomplete metamorphosizing insects, and you can't really break down all of this with that distinction because you have incomplete metamorphosis here and here. Um, and then holometabolus would be all of your um, endoterigotes. Um But your hemometabolus are your exoterigotes and your paleopterans. So, endo and exoterigota are the next classification here. Um, this is all kind of subclass level stuff in front orders and whatever else is going on. I don't know all of the nitty gritty in between steps of taxonomy, um, but that's not what I'm aiming for. And then within the end of Terracotta, you have these groups of insects. You have your Amphiasmonoptera, which I call closed winged insects because everybody else is classified as an Anthliophora. Which are your naked winged insects um, within the endoterragotes. Um, like your beetles and your flies and your wasps and things like that that um, <coughs> don't have any covering to the wings. Um, Lepidoptera and Trichoptera, which are part of this super order here, are um, insects that have scales or hair on the wings. Your Lepidopterans are scaly winged insects and your Trichopterans are your hair winged insects, although the common ancestor of both of these had things more related to hairs than scales. That's a different matter. Um, again, if we want to think about these as not having any covering to the wings, insects like grasshoppers and mantises, which belong here, also don't have any hairs or scales on the wings. Um, which is probably not entirely true. I think that within any of these groups, you'll have some hair on various body parts, um, but not in, a, in an appreciable sense. So in my next video, we will zoom in even further, or even closer, on our Lepidoptera, so we can start talking about the different groups of Lepidoptera and where they fall in relation to each other, because that really is the aim of this series. That's what I'm the best first in. I strongly recommend if you want to know anything about the groups before this, you consult other resources. You should always consult other resources. I love to relay information, but I'm not infallible, and I know somewhat of what I'm talking about here, but some of the stuff confuses me. Some of the stuff is constantly in review and being um, reclassified, which makes this sort of thing that much harder. And it's not really anybody's fault. When you have a group like Insecta, where there are easily tens of millions of species, most that have not yet been described, you're not going to, you know, quickly or easily get to an answer as to where things fall.